Now in our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1166 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The recently released AWRL Executive Committee minutes record President Roderick's deep displeasure with the FCC. The Federal Communications Commission reaffirms a nearly $3 million fine for marketing unauthorized drone television transmitters on the amateur bands. We will have the details. The Hurricane WatchNet activated on Friday but stood down for reactivation on July 3rd for severe weather in the Atlantic. We will tell you about it. The Russian woodpecker over the horizon radar antenna array is now a cultural heritage site. The WISA Woodsat successfully completes a stratospheric test flight. Field day contest entries are pouring into league headquarters. We will have the latest update. The AWRL announces a new partnership with flashlight manufacturer Maglite. We will have the details. The FCC releases a further notice in satellite launch proceedings involving the 70 and 5 centimeter bands. And kids are taking radio science into a completely new direction. We will give you a peek behind the curtain in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about a recent exploit to Western Digital Network attached storage devices. He will also touch on the recent announcement of Windows 11 by Microsoft, and he will tell you about an app that allows users to become a government spy for hire. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us how the amateur radio hobby grows when you share. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill starts a series looking at amateur radio's fallen flags, beginning with the National Radio Company. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will present part five of his six-part series on writing a successful public service announcement to promote your club's activities on local broadcast radio stations. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Fireworks Covered, Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And coming to you from our news bureau in the broadcast capital of the world where the signal never sleeps, this is N2WWW in Schenectady, New York. And reporting from the rain-soaked hills of the western Catskill Mountains in upstate New York, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where it rains every afternoon, but then again it is Florida, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where it's hot enough to fry a feed line, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we seem to be settling into a more summer-like weather pattern, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. This is W2XBS, and we have some late-breaking news as we come to air this week. AWRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, has expressed his deep personal displeasure with the lack of action by the FCC on amateur radio matters. The minutes of the AWRL Executive Committee meeting held on June 8, 2021, say that Mr. Roderick voiced his deep personal displeasure with the lack of action by the FCC on amateur matters that are impairing the amateur service, saying that and we quote, it is embarrassing that American amateurs built upon its century old tradition of message handling by developing many of the original digital message handling techniques currently in widespread use, but due to a 1980s era rule are prevented from communicating with stations in other countries using the most efficient state of the art digital techniques, unquote. 
Continuing, Mr. Roderick commented that even more damaging is that the 1980s era rule and the delay in addressing other amateur proceedings, some of which have been languishing for over eight years, are collectively preventing the amateur service from advancing the skills of new hams in both communications and technical phases of the advancement of the radio arts. Ending his comments, he shared his belief that efforts of the amateur service to recruit new hams and interest students in STEM subjects are being thwarted by the lack of FCC action on long-pending matters that the AWRL has repeatedly urged the FCC to update and allow American amateur operators to join the rest of the world's amateurs in the experimentation and development of exciting new communications modes. The Executive Committee minutes record the FCC has failed to resolve the following amateur radio-related proceedings. Docket number 16-235, known as the Symbol Rate Petition, initiated by the AWRL, filed on November 15, 2013, and assigned RM 11708. After receiving comments, the FCC adopted a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking proposing to delete the 300 baud symbol rate as requested, but declining to propose any bandwidth limitation in its place. This NPRM was adopted by the Commission on July 27, 2016. Comments received, and it remains pending. RM 11828, enhancing the technician class privileges, would, among other proposals, allow the entering technician class licensee to engage in and learn digital and voice communications on limited portions of the HF bands below 10 meters. Petition filed by the AWRL on February 28, 2018, and assigned RM 11828. Comments have been received and still remains pending. RM 11759, rebalancing the 80 and 75 meter subbands, would relieve congestion that is particularly bad in portions of the band. CW and digital modes are squeezed below 3.600. The petition filed by the AWRL on January 8, 2016. Comments have been received and it still remains pending. And finally, RM 11767. Eliminating the 15 dB HF amplifier gain limit would delete the 15 dB HF amplifier restriction originally adopted in 1978 within a set of rules, many since repealed, that intended to prevent use of amateur HF amplifiers by CBers. Many modern amplifiers use LDMOS devices that have greater gain capabilities than tubes but cannot be marketed in the U.S. without modification to limit gain. This petition was filed by Expert Linears America, LLC, on April 7, 2016. Comments received, and it still remains pending. After receiving comment, the Wireless Bureau denied the waiver request on December 27, 2016, finding in part that ruling on the waiver request would prejudice the outcome of the petition for rulemaking by prematurely deciding the issue. And now, with our lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Our lead story this week. In a memorandum, opinion, and order released on June 17th, the Federal Communications Commission denied a petition for reconsideration filed by Hobby King of a $2,861,128 fine for marketing non-compliant RF equipment and for failing to respond to FCC orders in its investigation of the company's practices. In the same step, the Commission enforced its equipment marketing rules. The fine resulted from an FCC investigation initiated by AWRL's January 2017 complaint that Hobby King equipment was blatantly illegal at multiple levels. The forfeiture order is the final chapter of a story that started with a report to the AWRL board by the Electromagnetic Compatibility Committee in 2017 as a result of the discovery that aerial drone TV transmitting equipment was being imported and marketed without proper FCC authorization under FCC Part 15 rules, said AWRL Electromagnetic Compatibility Committee Chair Kermit Carlson, W9XA. As spelled out in AWRL's 2017 complaint, the AWRL laboratory had documented that the operating frequencies of these drone TV transmitters near the 1.3 GHz amateur band were dip switch selectable for frequencies internationally assigned for use by aeronautics navigation, GPS, GLONASS L1, ATC mode S, as well as to both the interrogation and reply frequencies used for air traffic control air route surveillance transponder radar systems. 
Transmissions from these drone TV transmitters would have caused harmful interference to these essential navigation and ATC radar systems, presenting a real and dangerous threat to the safety of flight, Carlson said. ARRL's complaint noted that given the channel configuration, these units would not have a legitimate amateur radio use and that the marketing was directed at drone enthusiasts and not to licensed radio amateurs. ARRL laboratory tests did prove that only one of the seven available channels was within the 1.3 GHz amateur band, Carlson said. This is another example of ARRL not only affirmatively acting to protect our members' interests, but also acting to protect the safety and security of vital services and the general public, Carlson said. Hobby King has denied that it was marketing its drone transmitters to U.S. customers, but as the ARRL January 2017 complaint pointed out, ARRL laboratory manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, was able to purchase two drone transmitters from Hobby King and have them shipped to a U.S. address for testing in the lab. Hare and ARRL lab staffers Mike Gruber, W1MG, and Bob Allison, WB1GCM, tested the units. Carlson, as well as the Electromagnetic Compatibility Committee he chairs, were credited in the complaint for calling attention to the issue and prompting ARRL's action. The FCC noted that amateur radio equipment used to telecommand model craft are limited to 1 watt, 1,000 milliwatts, but three transmitters included in the FCC investigation operated at significantly higher power levels of 1,500 milliwatts and 2,000 milliwatts, ARRL said. Hobby King had told the FCC that it had no notice of the Commission's authorization requirements, that the Fifth Amendment relieved Hobby King of its duty to respond, that the forfeiture amount was inappropriate because its parent company, indubitably incorporated, lacked the ability to pay for the forfeiture order, and that the Commission was time-barred from taking action against ABC Fulfillment Services, LLC, because it was not part of Hobby King's business. Upon review of Hobby King's petition for reconsideration and the entire record, we find no basis for reconsideration because the petition fails to present new information warranting reconsideration, the FCC said in its memorandum opinion and order. Rather, Hobby King again raises the very same arguments already considered and rejected in the forfeiture order. The fine reaffirms the monetary penalty sought in a June 2018 FCC notice of apparent liability. The FCC said it found that dozens of devices marketed by the company transmitted in unauthorized radio frequency bands and in some cases operated at excessive power levels. Hobby King is the trade name of two U.S.-based companies that include ABC Fulfillment Services LLC and Indubitably Incorporated. Hobby King has a New York office and a customer service operations in the U.S., the FCC noted. In its earlier forfeiture order, the FCC said it had made clear that devices used in the amateur radio service do not require authorization prior to being imported into the United States, but if such equipment can operate in amateur and non-amateur frequencies, it must be certified prior to marketing and operation. The FCC investigation found that 65 models of devices marketed by Hobby King did not have required FCC certification. Responding to the FCC, Hobby King claimed to have ceased marketing the 65 models the FCC identified, but promised only to make best efforts not to market other non-compliant RF devices. Hobby King has a continuing obligation to market only radio frequency equipment that is properly authorized, the FCC said. We therefore remind Hobby King that continuing to market non-compliant radio frequency devices could result in further significant forfeitures. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and MAG Instrument, the U.S. manufacturer of the MAGLite flashlight, have announced they have formed a partnership based on common interests in equipping people to be prepared for emergencies and to serve their communities in extreme situations such as natural disasters. ARRL members expand the reservoir of trained operators and technicians in radio communications and radio technology and provide public service through the ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Maglite is the leading maker of U.S. manufactured high-quality flashlights that have a deserved reputation for toughness and durability. Amateur radio operators or hams help people in times of difficulty, often by supporting emergency communications where critical infrastructure is damaged and by aiding first responders' need to keep connected, said Anthony Maglica, founder, owner, and CEO of Mag Instrument Incorporated. We manufacture a product that has been used in public safety for over 40 years, and we are very supportive of the incredible dedication of radio amateurs, so culturally, this is a great alliance for both brands. 
ARRL is delighted that Maglite recognizes the service and skill of ARRL members. This partnership will help us introduce amateur radio to more people, said David Minster, NA2AA, ARRL CEO. Mag Instruments is creating a special laser-engraved Maglite product collection for ARRL, as well as offering their members special pricing on a select line of Maglite gear. In turn, those purchases raise funds to support ARRL's mission. Members can find details at www.arrl.org benefits and by clicking Member Discounts in the left-hand navigation on that page. ARRL, headquartered in Newington, Connecticut, counts the majority of active radio amateurs in the U.S. among its ranks. Since its founding in 1914, ARRL and its members have advanced the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio. In Australia, hams have been waiting for official word on their request to get two-by-one contest call signs. The wait may be soon over. The Australian Communications and Media Authority, or ACMA, has advised the amateurs it will begin approving the use of two-by-one call signs for contesting shortly. The ACMA said in its June 29th e-bulletin, that it is working out how the call signs will be issued. The new call signs will be implemented by the Australian Maritime College. The two by one call signs are to be restricted to use specifically during local and international contests and may only be issued to advanced class license holders. There were no further details on the timetable nor on the specifics of the implementation. The AMCA has advised amateurs that while a call sign application system is being finalized, no one is to apply for a two-by-one call sign since none are available yet, and the correct application system is not yet live. Any hams who have mistakenly applied for the two-by-one call signs will have their monies refunded. Meanwhile, the authority has said it would make no planned changes to the way visiting amateurs operate in Australia under the Overseas Amateurs Visiting Australia Class License. This license allows short-term operation without having to obtain a formal apparatus license. The arrangements will remain as is for now, at least until further notice. The ACMA is also proposing to outline how visiting amateurs will be expected to comply with the electromagnetic energy standards. All right, I accept some guilt in suggesting that amateur radio emergency communications in many developed countries is losing relevance. I was involved in these activities for decades, but these days the authorities pat us on the head and tell us they've got it all covered. It's a shame, because volunteer assistance from radio hams in emergencies is a jolly good bargaining tool for national societies, but those arguments are getting flakier. But let's be clear, in some parts of the world there is a critical reliance on radio amateur support for the emergency services. And don't think it's necessarily just in the third world where an already limited infrastructure is badly damaged by natural disasters. Essential reliance on volunteer communicators is still a reality right here in Europe. Let's point our beams towards Norway to find out more. The Norwegian Radio Relay League will receive more than 820,000 kroner, that's nearly 67,000 pounds, from the Yensidia Foundation to strengthen emergency preparedness. The NRRL said that this represents an important and long-awaited boost and will significantly strengthen the preparedness in Norway. For several years, the Yensidia Foundation has been concerned that volunteer rescue crews, among other things, lack the necessary, suitable and good technical equipment. This weakens the entire voluntary rescue service and emergency preparedness in Norway. Therefore, 54 million kroner was set aside for the Voluntary Organisation's Rescue Professional Forum, which includes the seven organisations that make up the backbone of the voluntary rescue service. Among the applications that were approved was the Norwegian Radio Relay League, which has now received the funding to contribute to a safer society through a further development of the rescue service. Henrik Solhaug, head of the Liaison Service in the Norwegian Radio Relay League, said it was fantastic news. The money received will be used to develop and produce new tracking units that they use in the rescue service. This will protect volunteer crews and dogs that are out in action with better accuracy than before. The tracking units send an almost continuous positional signal so that the location of the crews can be shown on a map in real time, regardless of existing infrastructure. Accurate tracking is also helpful for those who lead the activities, because it makes it easier to plan ahead. 
In addition to the money that will be used for the new tracking units, the Norwegian Radio Relay League has received funding for much-needed equipment, joint exercises and skill development from their groups around the country together with groups from other voluntary organisations. With more appropriate and important equipment becoming available, emergency capability and capacity improves, which benefits those in need of help. The volunteers will be able to hold professional days and carry out exercises that will strengthen the competence of operational management and collaboration with other rescue agencies. Volunteer crews have been a critical part of the Norwegian Rescue Service for more than 50 years. In close cooperation with the police and the main rescue centre, for years they've searched for and found thousands of missing people, saving hundreds of lives. These are tasks that the public sector itself does not have the capacity to perform, and volunteers have largely covered the costs themselves. The head of Gift Awards at the Yensidia Foundation said that without the significant effort from the Voluntary Rescue Service, the unique emergency preparedness system in Norway would not exist. But the fact that volunteer crews have to finance clothing, equipment and technological aids themselves has shown that there is a potential for improvement. Therefore, the Foundation was pleased to be able to allocate funds to strengthen the Voluntary Rescue Service, not only for materials and equipment, but also for competence-enhancing measures, for experimental activities and innovation, as well as for recruitment work. With this holistic approach, the Foundation wanted to contribute to an ongoing strengthening so that the Voluntary Rescue Service in Norway was best equipped to handle tomorrow's challenges. For more information, go to tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Norway. The Hurricane WatchNet activated Friday morning at 1300 UTC for Hurricane Elsa, which became a Category 1 storm early on Friday. As of 1800 UTC on Friday, Hurricane Elsa was about 95 miles west northwest of St. Vincent and 580 miles east-southeast of Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. The storm is packing maximum sustained winds of 85 miles per hour and is moving to the west-northwest at a brisk 29 miles per hour. Because the storm was extremely close to Barbados, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent, we went into operation to collect and forward weather data to the National Hurricane Center in Miami. Net Manager Bob Graves, KB5HAV, said, Given the extremely short notice, I seriously doubt people on the islands knew to expect Hurricane WatchNet on the air. But just to be safe, Hurricane WatchNet was there to handle weather data and other traffic as needed. The net was suspended at 1615 UTC. Graves said the HWN is now focusing on its next activation. At this time, it appears we will be activating Saturday morning, July 3rd, at 1400 UTC on 14.325 megahertz and remain active on this frequency for as long as we have propagation, Graves said. We plan to start our 40 meter net on 7.268 megahertz beginning at 2300 UTC. We will remain active on 40 meters for as long as propagation holds. Graves said that if the net is needed and Elsa remains a hurricane, the HWN plans to activate on Sunday, July 4th, 1200 UTC on 14.325 MHz and remain active on this frequency for as long as propagation holds. We start our 40 meter net on 7.268 MHz at 2300 UTC, Graves said. These activation plans are subject to change, Graves stressed. Any change in these plans will be posted on our website. This year, during HWN activations, members of the Salvation Army's Saturn Net will be monitoring on frequency to assist with any requests for outgoing health and welfare traffic from the affected area. HWN welcomes and encourages radio amateurs to report observed ground truth data from the affected area. Information needed includes wind speed, wind gust, wind direction, barometric pressure, rainfall, damage, and storm surge. Measured weather data is always appreciated, but estimates are welcome. We are always ready and available to provide backup communications to official agencies, such as emergency operations centers, the Red Cross, and storm shelters in the affected area. We also collect and forward significant damage assessment data to FEMA officials stationed in the National Hurricane Center, Graves said. 
Carl Gardenias, WU6D of Paris, California, is retiring as ARRL, Orange Section Manager, after serving in the position since 2003. His term of office had expired at the end of March, but he agreed to continue serving as Section Manager until a successor was chosen. A resolicitation for Section Manager nominations in the Orange Section was issued this past spring. The only nominee responding by the June 4th deadline was Bob Turner, W6RHK, also of Paris, California. Turner's elected two-year term of office does not officially begin until October 1st, and Gardenius had said he wished to step down as section manager at the end of June. In accordance with the rules and regulations of the ARRL field organization, ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, has appointed Turner to start his term of office as the Orange Section Manager earlier than scheduled, with the appointment effective July 1st. Walters made his decision after consulting with ARRL Southwestern Division Director Dick Norton, N6AA, and Gardenias. Turner has been Section Emergency Coordinator for the past 10 years. ARRL Eastern Washington Section Manager Jack Tilly, 87FO, will be stepping down early from his term of office that concludes on September 30, 2021. Tilly of Spokane Valley has been Section Manager for two and a half years. Joe Whitney, KA7LJQ, was the only nominee when the June 4th nomination deadline arrived, and she was declared elected. Whitney initially was scheduled to start her term of office on October 1st, but because Tilly is stepping down before the end of his term, Walters, after consulting with ARRL Northwestern Division Director Mike Ritz, W7VO, has appointed Whitney to start her term of office on July 1st. Whitney of Yakima has been an ARRL emergency coordinator since 2003, and she served as a district emergency coordinator in 2018 and 2019. The Federal Communications Commission is soliciting a second round of comments on whether to authorize commercial space entities to obtain licenses for frequencies used exclusively during space launch activities. For further details, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. The proposals include parts of the 70 and 5 centimeter bands, although they appear to pose no danger to either secondary amateur allocation. The federal government has allocated this spectrum on a primary basis and routinely uses it during space launches, but commercial space companies must obtain short-term special temporary authority or STA authorizations from the FCC to use it for the same purpose. The last decade has seen a dramatic increase in commercial space launches. In April, the FCC adopted some of its proposals from 2013 and solicited additional comment in a further notice in the proceeding allocation of spectrum for non-federal space launch operations. The proposals would allow private commercial space companies to obtain regular FCC licenses instead of launch-specific STAs in a number of bands, including 420 to 430 megahertz and 5650 to 5925 megahertz. Comments are due on or before July 12th. Reply comments, those are comments on the comments already filed, are due on or before August 9th, 2021. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The federal government, including the U.S. Department of Defense, is the primary user of both bands. Amateur operations are allocated on a secondary basis. The FCC again seeks comment on whether it should give commercial space launch entities access to the same limited space launch uses already employed by the federal government on this spectrum. Primary federal users heavily employ the 70 centimeter segment for radio location applications. Frequencies in the 420 to 430 MHz segment also can be used during space launches to send a flight self-destruct signal if a launch goes off course and poses danger to a populated area. The Commission's 2013 proposal, repeated in 2021, would permit use restricted to flight termination during launches by commercial space launch companies. Primary federal users also make use of 5650 
to 5925 MHz for radio location applications with channels used during launches for radar tracking. The Commission proposes to permit use by commercial entities similarly limited to use for radar tracking of launch vehicles. The Commission notes in its further notice of proposed rulemaking that since 2013, commercial entities have become established in space launch operations that were formerly the province of NASA. To support these commercial space ventures, entities such as the New Mexico Space Board Authority, the Virginia Commercial Space Flight Authority, and the Houston Airport System have established non-federal spaceports, the FCC said, noting that five bands, including 420 to 430 MHz and 5650 to 5925 MHz, are commonly used for communication with and tracking of launch vehicles. The Commission noted, however, that several commercial space launch providers indicated that they do not use either band for their operations. The FCC said that it has not granted an STA for the 420 to 430 MHz band related to space launches, and in the recent past, only one operator obtained special temporary authorities to use the 5650 to 5925 MHz band for a small number of launches. The Commission concluded that, given the limited current use of these bands during space launches by commercial space entities, we are not convinced that there is a need for new allocations for either band. Once again, comments are due on or before July 12, 2021. Reply comments are due on or before August 9, 2021. The American Radio Relay League is the USA's National Amateur Radio Society, and later this month, ARRL board members from across the US will join elected officials in reopening the world's headquarters at 225 Main Street, Newington, in the state of Connecticut, in a rededication of its operations. The ARRL has over 158,000 members, all of whom are essentially amateur radio operators and hobbyists. There are over 2,000 members in Connecticut alone. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they checked in on each other from across the globe. The ARRL's Bob Indebitson said that in a world of Zoom meetings and lots of online streaming, it really offered an alternative for ham radio operators to communicate with each other. The ARRL even saw a surge of new interest. In the midst of isolation, amateur radio became a window to the world for a lot of people. There's lots on the agenda. It's the beginning of the new hurricane season, and last weekend was the ARRL's Field Day. Over 35,000 ham radio operators participated in what they refer to as Amateur Radio's largest demonstration. The rededication movement is a way for the ARRL to move forward from the pandemic and celebrate its growing membership. You can read the full Bristol Press article at www.bristolpress.com. The world's first wooden CubeSat successfully completed a test flight into the stratosphere earlier this month. Here with more details on this unique satellite project is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. Wise WoodSat is constructed using birch plywood panels in a 1U configuration measuring 10 by 10 centimeters. Nine small solar cells will power the satellite, which will orbit at an altitude of 500 to 550 kilometers. The novel spacecraft will carry several amateur radio experiments, as well as photo downlinking, including selfies. A goal of the project is to determine how well wood products will perform in space. During the recent test, a functional model of the WISA Woodsat climbed 19 miles into the sky, tethered to a weather balloon. The satellite's camera captured a selfie video of the balloon bursting, a parachute deployed to take the nano satellite back to Earth, where it was recovered intact, lodged in a spruce tree. Fabricated in Finland, the wooden satellite is based on a basic KitSat CubeSat platform. Once in orbit, Wise Woodsat will be able to extend its selfie stick to capture photographs of the wooden box as it hurtles through space at 24,800 miles an hour. This will allow the mission leaders to monitor the impact of the environment on the plywood. The satellite would downlink its telemetry and images from two cameras using amateur radio frequencies. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The test satellite and a duplicate spare version were manufactured at UPM Plywood's Savlina Finland factory. The company sells its construction grade panels under the WISA trademark. The panels were thermo vacuum dried and processed on a CNC machining center. The wooden satellite is based on a basic versatile CubeSat format, KitSat, which is designed with educational use in mind. 
As the sponsor quipped, the Witset Woodset will go where no wood has ever gone before. With a mission to gather data on the behavior and durability of plywood over an extended period in the harsh temperatures, vacuum, and radiation of space in order to assess the use of wood materials in space structure. In addition to testing plywood, the satellite will demonstrate accessible radio amateur satellite communication, host several secondary technology experiments, validate the Kitsat platform in orbit, and popularize space technology. The popular K3Y event held by the Straight Key Century Club is getting a Canadian version. When the Straight Key Century Club holds its annual K3Y event, it marks the founding in 2006 of the world's largest organization of Straight Key Morse code CW operators and enthusiasts. Now the Straight Key Century Club will have something else to celebrate. A Canadian version of the popular event is in the works. The VE9 SKCC event is being planned for this coming September and it will be an opportunity to chase the Street Key Century Club's more than 1,000 Canadian members. According to a posting on the organization website, hams from the Northwest Territories to Prince Edward Island can get in on the action. It's a good opportunity for everyone to try for the Street Key Century Club's Canadian Maple Award, in which a ham needs to work one SKCC member from any of the provinces and territories listed on the SKCC website. The award is available in varying levels from yellow maple with 10 contacts to gold maple with 90 contacts when operating QRP. More details about the VE9 SKCC event will be available on the website in the weeks ahead. Visit skccgroup.com for more details. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I warn you. I warn you that I have heard anecdotal evidence only that some who listen to this show start out normal and turn into geeks. And I have to apologize if there's that side effect. We try to avoid it, but it can't be helped. Sometimes when we talk about all this cool stuff, people go, hey, that's cool. I might want to get into that. And then it's over. Do you have a Western Digital My Book Live? It's kind of a storage device, a network attached storage is uh, what it's called. I know a lot of you do. It's a very popular device. It was sold in the big box stores and so forth. So a lot of people got it as a kind of either an external hard drive or a backup device or a network backup device. Disconnect it from the internet right now. You might want to check to see if it's okay. Western Digital is recommending that you unplug MyBook Live storage devices from the internet until further notice while they try to figure out what the heck's going on. Users are reporting their data on these devices completely erased. Completely erased. Western Digital says, we weren't hacked. So maybe, it, I think, you know, probably likely there's something, a bug in the software that allows a bad guy who sees one of these devices on a network to go in and erase it entirely. This first came to light on the Western Digital Forums where users reported that the data loss coincided with a factory reset that was performed on their device. One person posted a log that said factory reset, shutting down for reboot, and boom, gone. Wow. Wow. So uh, it has, you know, I mean, it's, I had one of them. They stopped supporting it about six years ago. And apparently stopped updating it some time ago as well. They are being wiped clean. Unplug it if you haven't already uh, experienced this. My Book Live and My Book Live Duo from Western Digital. It's a, it's a bug. It might be a bug that is Western Digital's fault. It might be a malefactor, a bad guy, a hacker. It's hard to There's no ransom notes. There's no other threats. I wouldn't rule out a, a flaw in the software at this point. Western Digital, uh, talking to a bleeping computer, said they're investigating the attacks, but they don't think it was a compromise of their servers. The MyBook Live device received its final update in 2015, so it's a pretty old device. We are currently investigating, says Western Digital. We'll provide updates to this when they're available. Well, hmm. By the way, since the last update in 2015 there was in fact a remote code execution vulnerability disclosed whoops and it was never fixed cve 2018 so it's three years later 1847 
two, and apparently nobody did anything with it until just now. So what have we learned here? <laughs> well, first of all, how important it is that uh, devices continue to be updated for security. This was a security flaw discovered three years ago that was never fixed by Western Digital. Not good. You might hold that against Western Digital. I think you'd, you'd have every right to. It also um, underscores, you know, when you buy something, you want to make sure that it's being kept up to date, that it's from a reliable, responsible company. And when it goes out of service, maybe start thinking about replacing it. There's another important lesson, though, a pretty important lesson, which is I know this is a backup device. And I think people go, well, my data is backed up on this backup device. And then they don't worry about the originals or they erase the originals. They only have one copy on this backup device. Well, it's a backup. See, it's backed up. It says backup right on it. But one copy of anything, I don't care where it is, is not a backup. One copy of anything is a recipe for disaster. If you've got stuff that you've made, that you've created, that you haven't backed up, that you don't have multiple copies of, do it now because these things happen. Uh, I've mentioned this many, many times. I'll, I'll mention it again in credit to my friend Peter Krogh, who is a photographer. You know, photographers take about, care about this stuff a lot. They really care about this stuff a lot. They, um, you know, well, imagine, you know, if you're a, you're phot photographing a wedding or a lo another life event and you lose the pictures, they're not going to stage it again for you. That baby's not going to be born a second time. The wedding's not going to happen again. Maybe you get the bride and groom to come pose for pictures. Good luck. <laughs> it's not going to be a fun conversation. So Peter uh, pays a lot of attention to backup. Uh, in fact, he has a really good site that he did with the Library of Congress some years ago, but it's still good. And his backup strategy is there, along with other uh, really excellent information for photographers it's from the American Society of Media Photographers. It's dpbestflow.org. Best flow as in best workflow. dpbestworkflow.org. And it's really about best workflow practices. But, of course, among those best workflow practices are backup. And he coined the idea, the term which I've repeated many, many times, of 3 two, one backup. Because it's easy to remember. Three copies of anything. Not one. That's not a backup. Two even is a little sketch. Three, ideally on two different media. You know, maybe a Western Digital My Book Live was one of them, but another one might be cloud storage or it might be a CD somewhere. You know, two different kinds of mediums. So you're not reliable relying on one particular thing. This is a good case for that. And and finally, the third part of three, two, one. One copy should be in the cloud, up in the sky or off site. Actually, really technically off site. I say in the cloud because that's off-site, you know, on the internet, whether it's, you know, a backup service or Apple's iCloud or Microsoft's OneDrive or Dropbox. Those are all cloud services that store your data. One of the three copies should be in the cloud. And that's, you know, if the worst happens and, you know, the house falls in on itself or something. Three, two, one. So people who did that, you know, your My Book Live goes south. Okay. But I have another copy somewhere. I would get rid of that My Book Live. It's out of date and there are exploits. And, you know, you're, if really, honestly, this is hard to believe, you might be lucky that all they did was delete the data. With this vulnerability, they could have done other things, including, and maybe they did, we don't know yet, exfiltrate, download all of the data on your drive, and maybe you're going to get an email at some point saying, hey, I have your data, the data you just lost. Would you like it back? Would you like it back? And if you would, just send me, a, you know, one or two bitcoins. That'll that'll do. That'll do me fine. You know, I'm waiting for that other shoe to drop. Three, two, one, back up. You just go no. <laughs> but I wouldn't use that Western Digital anymore. It's not been patched for years. Holy cow! What a terrible thing. And if it happened to you, I'm very, very sorry. Microsoft announced Windows 11. We knew they would. And uh, there's been some consternation uh, amongst people. You know, it's funny because inevitably when, when there's something like this, a lot of people are going to say, oh, I can't wait to get it. But a lot of people are going to say, oh, I hate it. How long can, do I have before I have to get it? I don't want it. But the biggest noise this time 
which it's kind of funny, is from people who say, I can't get it, I want it. Microsoft announced that it's not going to run a lot of older machines, maybe machines not even that much older, maybe a couple of years old, because it's going to require a secure uh, hardware device called TPM. A lot of computers don't have that, especially gaming computers or hobbyist, you know, home-built computers. And it also is not going to work with uh, a variety of Intel chips, including the i7-7000, which is fairly recent. So there's a lot of noise. Now, I wouldn't panic yet. Uh, first of all, it's not going to come out till later this year. It's really going to be for new computers. That's really, I think, the point of this. But a lot of upset. And I'm sure we'll be talking more about this, not only today, but for the weeks to come. Windows 11 uh, will be available later this month for what, what they call insiders, people who sign up for the Microsoft Windows Insiders program, which you, anybody can do, many do, millions do chance to try new software before it's official and before it's finalized. So you should be able to get it, we think, maybe even as early as a Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, uh, as a Windows Insider. But the rest of the world won't be getting it until this fall or maybe even early 2022. Windows 11. Nothing much new under the hood. It's all uh, it's all cosmetic. It's, all pre it's pretty. Pretty. Not knocking it. But uh, watch because there's going to be a lot of a lot of people go, wait a minute. Hey, I can't run it. I didn't want it, but now I really do. Right? That's really what it is. I didn't want it, but I do want it now because you won't give it to me. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? Actually, websites are old hat. Did you get the memo? Sure they are. They're old hat. Really now today, to be a hip, hip person, you have to have an app. I don't have an app. <sighs> Darn it. I'm trying to keep up, folks. It's just moving so fast. Don't have an app. So there's an app. This is interesting. I didn't I didn't know this. It's not used uh, very much in the U.S. It's an app that's used worldwide called Premise. And uh, mostly in the, in the developing world, people complete tasks for small payments in this app. Well, a nice way to make a little money. And... Typically, what you'll be asked to do is snap a photo, fill out a survey, you know, that kind of thing. Observe where an ATM is or what's the cost of a consumer good. Turns out half of the company's clients are private businesses looking for commercial information. I'm a bank. I want to know how many ATMs there are in a neighborhood. But in the recent years, the other half has been going to the U.S. military and foreign governments as reconnaissance as spying, basically. Used to be you'd have a person out in the field, you know, collecting this information, our man in Havana. Why do that in the modern age? Why bother having an operative? That's dangerous, risky. Often the case, as in that book, Our Man in Havana, that the information is made up. But premise, you can just automate the whole thing. The company says, this is from the Wall Street Journal this week, 90% of the work is gauging public sentiment an understanding human geography. A number of projects involve asking users to go out in the world to complete tasks like taking pictures or walking a predetermined route. Some of those tasks involve collecting data on nearby wireless signals or other cell phones. Interesting. The company uh, says it has 600,000 users in 43 countries, including hotspots like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and Yemen, Premise has received at least $5 million in the last four years on military projects, contracts from the Air Force and the Army as a subcontractor to other defense entities. In one pitch on its technology prepared in 2019 for the, the uh, JSOC, the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force Afghanistan, Premise proposed three potential uses that could be carried out in a way that's responsive to commander's information requirements. This is brilliant. We've always said your smartphone is a spy device, but this is this is quite literally what they're doing. They could gauge the effectiveness of U.S. information operations, scout and map out key social structures such as mosques, banks, Internet cafes, and covertly monitor cell tower and Wi-Fi signals. The presentation said the tasks needed to be designed to safeguard true intent. So the contributors don't even know what they're doing is spying. I think if they knew, they might charge more. What a story. I was, it was, uh, of course, it, uh, I admire it on the, I mean, it's brilliant, right? 
but just reminds you that that smartphone you have in your pocket, that, that little computer that's always connected to the Internet, which has a microphone and a camera and lots of radios transmitting data all the time, that is the best spy device anybody ever invented. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Among railroad enthusiasts, they are known as fallen flags, rail companies that have disappeared from the American scene. Some, such as the New York, Ontario, and Western Railway, were completely abandoned, their rails torn up and the right-of-way slowly returning to nature. Others such as the Erie, the New York Central, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and, most recently, Conrail, disappeared in the black hole of corporate mergers, their infrastructure living on under another name. Amateur radio also has its fallen flags. Radio companies that once dominated the RF landscape of our hobby, but now are gone. Some went bankrupt, their assets sold and their factories torn down to make way for urban renewal. Others, facing the harsh competitive realities in a small amateur market, abandoned ham radio and turned to other, more profitable communication activities. In the next few installments, we will look at our fallen flags, starting with the National Radio Company. National began life in 1914 as, believe it or not, a toy company. From 1914 through the early 1920s, the National Toy Company made a healthy profit on toys and household goods. During World War I, National made airplane parts and thread gauges. In 1922, National reached a crossroad. The broadcast business was booming and there was a severe shortage of quality radio components needed to build receivers. The largest manufacturer of variable capacitors at that time was Cardwell. Note that name, we'll be seeing it again. The demand for capacitors far exceeded Cardwell's ability to supply, and National, always seeking new profitable markets, began manufacturing variable capacitors. In 1924, National was approached by two Harvard engineers, Glenn Browning and Fred Drake. They wanted National to manufacture their Browning Drake tuner, which was a vast improvement over other broadcast band tuners then on the market. National agreed, and the tuner became so popular that the company decided to drop all of its non-radio products, change its name, and concentrate on radio receivers and components. They began looking for someone to guide the company exclusively into the radio market and, in 1927, hired a young man named James Millen as chief engineer and general manager. In 1928, National introduced the SW-2, followed in the 1930s by the SW-3, SW-4, and SW-5. The SW stood for shortwave, and the number indicated how many tubes the unit had. These were high-quality regenerative receivers, very popular with shortwave listeners and amateurs. Production on this series lasted 20 years until 1948. Other early receivers from National, designed exclusively for the broadcast market, included the MB-29, introduced in 1929, and the MB-30 in 1930. Both of these units were tuned radio frequency receivers with several stages of RF application. In 1935, National introduced the receiver that would carry it through the next 30 years, the HRO. 
This radio had a crystal filter, two RF stages, and a dial mechanism that was so accurate the receiver could be set within one kilocycle of the desired frequency. The 1930s also witnessed Nationals venture into the UHF spectrum with the model 1-10. This was a super regenerative receiver that covered 27 megacycles all the way up to 300 megacycles. World War II brought a massive increase in Nationals business. Employment swelled from 250 to over 2,500 as the company fulfilled its government contracts. In the post-war market, National held its own. The HRO receiver was still growing strong and was joined by various other receivers, the NC100, the NC200, and the NC300. For the beginning shortwave listener, or novice amateur, National introduced the affordable NC60, which covered the broadcast and shortwave bands from 550 kilocycles to 30 megacycles. I remember using this radio 30 years ago in my novice days. National also had some transmitters and transceivers, but their market share wasn't as strong as Collins, Heathkit, Halicrafters, or E.F. Johnson. In 1964, the HRO finally reached the end of its production life. Also that year, the National Radio Company sold its capacitor division. The purchaser? The Cardwell Condenser Corporation, National's old nemesis from the 1920s. In 1965, National introduced its last classic, the HRO 500. This was a fully synthesized, transistorized receiver that covered 5 kHz through 30 MHz in 60 separate 500 kHz segments. It was an outstanding receiver for use by the military, government agencies, or amateurs willing to pay top dollar for the very best. By the late 1960s, the Japanese were jumping into the U.S. amateur market with low-cost units. High-end companies such as National simply couldn't compete. Throughout the early 70s, National gradually faded from the amateur market and concentrated on government contracts. In the early 1970s, the National Radio Company went through bankruptcy. After reorganization, they emerged from bankruptcy and continued to supply the government with various radio products, including the HRO 500. Time was not on their side, however, and in 1991, the National Radio Company filed bankruptcy for the second and last time. The remaining assets of this once proud company were put on the auction block. And yes, in case you're wondering, the purchaser was the Cardwell Condenser Corporation. In our next installment, we will look at a company that was formed by one of National's former employees, as well as a famous amateur radio manufacturer whose name started with H. Which of the three possible companies am I talking about? So, until then, check out the internet auction sites for any HRO or SW3 receiver. They're a great investment. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Tony, Echo India 8 Juliet Kilo, keeper of the Echo India 2 Delta Kilo Hotel 2-meter transatlantic beacon, located at Kilcochran on the Sheep's Head Peninsula in West Cork, has announced that on advice received, the Q65 submode has been changed from A to C, as submode C is reported to be more sensitive for 144 MHz. Also following advice, the listening frequency has been changed from 144.120 to 144.178 MHz to avoid conflict with Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth operators. All the latest information on the beacon is regularly posted on the EI2DKHQRZ.com page. 
Time now for the AMSAT report. AMSAT has announced that its 39th Annual Space Symposium and Annual General Meeting will be held in late October at the Crown Plaza Suites, Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport in Bloomington, Minnesota. The AMSAT Board of Directors will meet prior to the symposium. Further details, including final dates, hotel reservations, tours, and other events will be announced in the coming weeks. Jean-Marc 3B8DU reports that MIRSAT-1 was successfully deployed into orbit from the International Space Station on June 22nd. The event was broadcast live on JAXA YouTube video. The Mauritius Amateur Society presented awards to 10 radio amateurs who received MIRSAT-1 telemetry and submitted a participation form. John Mark reported superb media coverage in Mauritius and Reunion Island on TV about MIRSAT. The satellite is in good health and commissioning tests are being performed by the MIRSAT-1 team. Digipeter and image broadcast activation dates have not yet been decided. The AMSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. It's time now for the weekly propagation forecast report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that solar activity is going strong. For the June 24th to July 1st reporting week, the average daily sunspot number rose from 14 to 34.7, while the average daily solar flux bumped up from 79.3 to 86.9. Both figures represent a dramatic increase in solar activity. The sunspot number last Thursday, June 24th, was 56, above the average of 34.7, and that's always a good sign. So let's take a look at the Planetary A index, which went from 5.3 to 6.1 over the reporting week, while the average daily middle latitude A index was steady at 6.1. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux is 94 on July 3rd through the 6th, 90 on July 7th through the 8th, 85 on July 9th through the 11th, 82 on July 12th to the 14th, and 80 on July 15th through the 18th. Taking a look at the predicted planetary A index, that will be 12, 8, 10, and 8 on July 3rd through the 6th, 5 on July 7th and 8th, 8 on July 9th and 10th, 5, 15, and 12 on July 11th through the 13th, and 5 on July 14th through the 20th. You want to make Moon Bounce contacts? Moon Bounce enthusiast Steve McDonald, VE7SL in British Columbia, Canada, wanted to determine a back-to-basics equipment complement for making 2-meter EME contacts. He came up with a 9-element Yagi, a 120-watt amplifier, and an antenna position control system that offer azimuthal rotation, but not elevation. By the way, the next ARRL EME contest weekend is October 23rd and 24th. The massive Duga-1 antenna array that transmitted the obnoxious and infuriating Russian Woodpecker HF signal from the 1970s until the late 1980s is now a cultural heritage site. Here with more details on this massive over-the-horizon radar array is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League headquarters in Newington. The array located near Chernobyl in Ukraine was part of an over-the-horizon radar system designed to detect and offer early warning of incoming ballistic missiles from the U.S. A complementary receiver site was located some 40 miles away. While the system was operating, its broad rat-a-tat signal, typically at a 10 hertz rate, caused severe interference on the amateur bands. The audio you just heard was the woodpecker drowning out a WWV transmission. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster and the end of the Cold War spelled the end of the system and the interference. Nearly 2,300 feet long and more than 450 feet tall, the steel beams of the radar array in the Chernobyl exclusion zone tower above the surrounding forest. Ukraine's Minister of Culture and Information Policy, Alexander Chakenko, said our heritage is not only the area around the power plant, but also the buildings located on its territory. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. You've probably seen Duga-1 before. Even if you didn't know you were looking at a famous Soviet-era piece of radio equipment nestled deep in an irradiated forest. 
Almost 2,300 feet long and more than 450 feet high, the steel beams of the radar tower over the surrounding forest. From a distance, it appears to be a massive wall or the start of a cage. The Duga one is the setting for several Call of Duty maps, including a prominent place for a sniper's nest in the new 80s-themed Warzone map. It also appears as the final map in Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War and the Sosnovka military base in player unknown battleground. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster and the end of the Cold War preceded the end of the system and the interference it caused. NATO military intelligence discovered and photographed the structure, which it dubbed the Steel Yard. Seen from a distance, it appears to be a massive wall or the start of a cage. As Vice recently reported, the Association of Chernobyl Tour Operators was the first to announce that Ukraine had made Duga-1 a protected heritage site. The Russian Interfax News Service later reported the official designation. The Soviet Union deployed two similar over-the-horizon radar installations known as Duga-1 and Duga-2, the one near Chernobyl and another in eastern Siberia. Transmitter power levels were rumored to be in the 10 megawatt EIRP range. Duga-1 was the focus of a 2015 documentary, The Russian Woodpecker, by Chad Gracia. The film includes interviews with Duga Commander Vladimir Musets and others involved in building and operating the over-the-horizon radar system. The production was a 2015 Sundance Film Festival winner in the documentary category. In recent years, the Duga-1 radar has also played a role in other films, as well as in various video games and novels. When Duga-1 came online sometime in the mid-1970s, radio operators around the world noticed a strange signal coming from the forests of Ukraine. The system was so powerful it disrupted some frequencies with an irritating thumping noise. Amateur radio operators dubbed the signal source the Russian woodpecker because of the repeated tapping noise it pumped into amateur and shortwave radios. On the 30th of June 2021, a new version of the Directory of Radio Amateurs in France was released. This was developed by the French regulator, the National Frequency Agency, ANFR, and it's been made available online. This directory makes it possible to find French call signs, the address of radio clubs, the manager of a repeater, or the special call signs issued by the French authority. This new facility, placed online, will provide the answer to many questions from the amateur radio community. And this new version takes into account respect for personal data imposed by the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. Thus, it is still possible for users to withdraw from the directory by registering on what is known as the Orange List. The directory includes a link for those listed to contest inaccurate data, thus facilitating dialogue between the regulator and users. Also, with the aim of complying with GDPR, a limit of results per search has been put in place. For greater accuracy, the search tool made available with the directory allows several criteria to be entered. It's now possible to launch a search by filtering the results in a number of ways, and in addition, it's possible to specify only the first two characters of a name to start the search. Another enhancement is the ability to search for special call signs via the name of the event, the start or the end date, as well as the call sign of the contact for the event. The online directory is available on the ANFR website, anfr.fr. Foundations of Amateur Radio Recently, I received a lovely email from Simon, Golf Zero, Echo India Yankee, who reminded me that there is a voice keyer that fits into a microphone. It was designed by Oli Delta Hotel 8 Bravo Quebec Alpha as a replacement for a standard Yesu MH31 microphone. I'd come across this a while ago and for several reasons put off actually ordering one, but Simon's encouragement tipped me over the fence and I've placed my order. What I'm expecting to arrive at some point is a kit that has the minuscule surface mount components already soldered to a circuit board, leaving a couple of individual components ready for my soldering iron abuse. I'll let you know how it goes. This little experience reminded me that I've been stumbling across solutions like this for years, an amateur with an itch to scratch and the drive to do something about it. For example, Paul, Kilo Echo Zero, Papa Bravo Romeo, likes to operate satellites, and in doing so, amassed a collection of frequencies. 
Since the Doppler effect alters the actual frequency depending on the satellite coming towards you or moving away from you, there are corrections that need to be done. If you're in the field, this is something you might struggle with, so Paul created a frequency cheat sheet. If you're looking into magnetic loop antennas, you'll quickly encounter a spreadsheet made by Steve Alpha Alpha 5 Tango Bravo that will get you started with the parameters for designing and building your own magnetic loop. The popular VK contest logger, known colloquially as VKCL, was built by Mike Victor Kilo 3 Alpha Victor Victor. It's a simple to use logging tool that has a large collection of rules for different contests, and Mike often brings out a new version to incorporate the latest rule changes just before a contest. It even incorporates a station log. If you've come across apps like Droid PSK, Droid SSTV, and Droid Ritty, they're the brainchildren of Wolfgang Whiskey 8 Delta Alpha. The increasingly popular repeater book, maintained by a global community of volunteers, is the work of Garrett, Kilo Delta 6, Kilo Papa Charlie. I've lost count of the number of radio amateurs running an online shop, where you can buy gear or kits or circuit boards, components, antennas, software and the like, not to mention an astonishing collection of professionally built tools like antenna analyzers, filters, amplifiers and more. It's said that amateurs are notorious for their short arms and deep pockets. I like to think of it as a discerning and informed customer. It's easy to sell snake oil to the masses. It's been going on for centuries. It's much harder to do that when the person you're selling to knows how the thing you're selling works and knows how to read a data sheet, let alone ask awkward questions when the need arises. Before I go on, I will mention that the people I've named here are unaware of me doing so. I've not been approached by any of them to mention their name, and I have no relationship other than being a happy customer. I'm saying this out loud because this podcast goes out on amateur radio repeaters all over the world, and commercial use of amateur radio is strictly prohibited. You might have gotten to this point wondering why I'm even taking the time to highlight some of the efforts I've come across, and the reason is very simple. This activity is everywhere. You just have to look. It's not like Ollie, Paul, Steve, Mike, Garrett or Wolfgang shouted their involvement from the rooftops. It's just that the information is available if you care to look. Remember, these people are radio amateurs, just like you and I. That's important because the difference between a tool that you're using, that you built, sitting in your shack or on your computer, and that of the people I've named, is that they took an extra step and shared their efforts with the community. Some amateurs are making a living from this hobby, and I applaud their efforts. For the rest of us, me included, that's often not the point. Invention is happening all over the world, right now. You are doing it despite your protestations to the contrary. You might have made a PDF that you carry around during a contest, or it might be a calculator you knocked up to figure out how to build something. It might be a circuit diagram, an app, a how-to guide, a map, or a video. All of these things are creations that can be shared to increase the amount of innovation that happens by people bouncing ideas off other ideas. In 1675, Sir Isaac Newton said, If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. You are one of those giants, and the person who uses your contribution to make their own is standing on your shoulders. What are you waiting for? Publish, share, document, photograph, and make available. It's how society makes progress, and it's how amateur radio stays at the forefront of innovation. Get on air and make noise is not purely restricted to the RF spectrum. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And if you've ever listened to amateur radio communications, whether it be speech or Morse code or data, you'll often hear hams exchanging the numbers 73. It basically means best regards. The ARRL website says that the first somewhat unofficial use of 73 appeared in the publication The National Telegraph Review and Operator's Guide, which was first published in April 1857. At that time, 73 meant my love to you. In 1859, the Western Union Company set up the standard 92 code. This was a list of numerals from 1 to 92, and it was compiled to indicate a series of prepared phrases for use by the operators on the wires. No doubt this was to speed up the repetition of standard phrases in Morse code. In the 92 code, 73 was changed to mean accept my compliments, which was in keeping with the florid language of that era.
Over the years, many manuals of telegraphy show variations on the meaning of 73, but best regards probably remains the most accurate, although it has acquired overtones of a warmer sentiment. Oh, by the way, it's always spoken as 73, never 73s, or even worse, 73s. The first Youth on the Air camp for young radio amateurs in North, Central, and South America begins on July 11th in Westchester, Ohio. With more on the Youth on the Air summer camp, we go to League Headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Among other activities, campers will be operating Special Event Station W8Y from both the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting in Westchester Township and from the Camp Hotel. The camp will run until July 16th. Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, said the camper count is 23. We're very excited to finally bring this program to the Americas, he told us. Our young people are bringing an incredible lineup of hands-on sessions for their peers. Rapp would also like to replicate the camp over multiple locations in the future and hopes it will help grow a more robust community of young hams. The long-awaited summer camp for up to 30 hams aged 15 through 25 had been set to take place in June 2020, but it had to be rescheduled until summer 2021 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The camp for young hams in the Americas took its cue from the summer youngsters on the air camps held for the past few years in various IARU Region 1 countries. ARRL and the Yasme Foundation donated project kits for the campers. Xtronics provided temperature-controlled soldering stations. For more information, contact Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, at director at youthontheair, all one word, dot O-R-G. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. W8Y will be on the air as campers complete projects, between sessions, and during free time. Dedicated operating times on HF will be Monday, July 12th, 0100 to 0330 UTC, Tuesday, July 13th, 0000 to 0330 UTC, and 1800 to 2130 UTC. Dedicated satellite station operating times will be Thursday, July 15th, 1400 to 1700 UTC, and Friday, July 16th, 1500 to 1700 UTC. An amateur radio on the International Space Station contact is currently set for either Wednesday, July 14th at 1503 UTC or Thursday, July 15th at 1416 UTC. It will be streamed live on the Youth on the Air YouTube channel. The camp opening observance on Sunday, July 11th from 2100 to 2230 UTC will feature keynote speaker Tim Duffy, K3LR. The hour-long closing ceremony on Friday, July 16th will get underway at 1700 UTC. The YouTube channel will also feature a daily video highlighting the activities of the previous day. The brochure on the Youth on the Air website includes more details about the camp. For additional information, contact Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. Meanwhile, camp is over for the dozen Ohio youngsters who spent a week exploring STEM, ham radio, and satellite communications, and now they are left to dream some amateur radio dreams. The students were guests at the fourth annual STEM camp created by Josh Ricard, K8KJR, and David Richardson, K3KDR. The camp was held in partnership with the Mercer County Amateur Radio Club and DX Engineering, along with the Mainline Education Foundation and Valley Christian Schools, where Josh is a former assistant superintendent. This was not a camp where the kids roasted marshmallows over campfires. The daily fair consisted instead of shortwave listening, a shortwave scavenger hunt, homebrew antennas, and signals received from the International Space Station's repeater. The campers got to watch and listen as Tommy Gober, N5DUX, had a satellite QSO with Michigan YL Grace Papai, KE8RJU, a member of the Youth Amateurs Communications Ham Team, known as Yacht. 
At the end of the week, instead of bringing home the customary arts and crafts projects or swimming trophies, the youngsters left with their homebrew Yagis, a pre-programmed HT that had the transmit function disabled, an SSB shortwave receiver, and a copy of Ward Silver's book, Ham Radio for Dummies. Camp may have ended, but for some, the radio dreams are ongoing. FierceWireless.com reports that UK Telecom's operator British Telecom has teamed up with OneWeb to explore how the satellite company's service could help close broadband gaps in areas beyond the reach of its mobile and fibre networks. Working together under a new Memorandum of Understanding, the companies aim to determine how connectivity from OneWeb's satellite constellation could be used to deliver increased coverage and capacity to consumers and businesses in remote areas of the UK. In addition to using OneWeb's technology to improve mobile service, they will explore other connectivity options including fixed wireless access broadband. Efforts will initially focus on serving UK customers, but the companies will also look at opportunities to roll out new global services for BT's international customers. A BT representative said that they were just beginning to explore how low Earth orbit satellite systems might be used to support a variety of services, adding that other partners besides OneWeb could also enter the mix. BT CEO Philip Janssen said in a statement that the operator's previously announced fibre expansion plan and mobile commitments have put BT at the forefront of efforts to expand digital connectivity across the UK. However, he noted, it is clear that greater partnership is needed, both with government and within industry, to ensure connectivity can reach every last corner of the country. Neil Masterson, OneWeb CEO, added that its satellite service will be a vital means for bridging the last digital divides across the network, and they're excited to be part of the solution with BT to expand the UK's digital infrastructure. You can read more at FierceWireless.com. Field day entries are arriving fast and furious. Three days into the field day entry submission period ending June 30th, I've already topped 3,000. And as we come to air, the count on July 2nd was 3651, with more on the way. ARRL Contest Program Manager Paul Burke, N1SFE, says 201 of these are three or more operator club entries. Class A, 385 or one and two person club and group entry. Class B, 33 are mobile entries. Class C, and 34 are EOC stations, Class F. 2,414 entrants operated from home stations, 1,831 is Class D on commercial power, and 583 is Class E operating on emergency power. Last year there were 10,213 total entrants, 611 is Class A, 1,086 is Class B, 134 is Class C, 6,318 Class D, 1,980 Class E, and 84 Class F. In 2019, before the pandemic, there were 3,113 total entries. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In the last four segments on promoting your not-for-profit ham radio club's events, we created a public service announcement and gathered names and addresses of local media outlets. We discussed other places to post your event flyers and where to mail your PSAs. This time we'll cover some of the realities of free promotions in these days of media conglomeration and downsizing. In the good old days of broadcast radio, even the boss's secretary had a secretary. Today, radio and TV stations often operate on skeleton crews, Computers playing wave files or commanding a stack of CD changers take the place of live on-the-air talent. At stations, which once employed 15 people, now operate on five or so, with many jobs contracted out or supplied by out-of-state ownership. This sad but real state of broadcasting has a direct effect on your ability to promote your nonprofit club's event. They simply do not have the manpower to research, verify, or prep your PSA for air. This is all the more reason why it must be ready to use as is when it arrives at the radio station. The more you do to make it ready for them, the more likely it is to be put on the air. 
the professional appearing PSA is also more likely to be read as is if it looks right too. If there is a fatal flaw in any of the important features in your PSA, it is always easier for the person who actually reads it on the air to simply use the next one instead. A traditional item in the broadcast studio is the PSA folder. This three-ring folder usually sits right in front of the announcer and not only contains your PSA, but also other information for the DJ. Radio stations usually use a three-ring folder with clear plastic sleeves. The announcer's time is scarce, so your PSA needs to be short, easy to read as is. It must not contain any grammar or spelling mistakes, should be double-spaced, and the portion to be read on the air should be visibly obvious to the reader in an instant. An example of this would be that in your PSA, the portion to be actually read on the air should be the only area on that page which is in bold text and double-spaced so it jumps out of the reader. Another trick is to use colored paper, but not the neon-like color. If all the pages in the PSA folder are white except yours, which is canary yellow, it makes it easier for the announcer to flip through the PSA folder to that page next time. You could put your PSA into a clear plastic sleeve and mail it to the radio station too. Never send a media outlet a handwritten PSA or ones that contain spelling and grammar mistakes. And always include contact information. Your club should designate a main contact person who has all the access to all the pertinent information about what is mentioned in your PSA and background information about your club, especially its nonprofit status. Retired people make the best contacts since they are usually easy to get a hold of during business hours. And my final strategy for promotional success is if your club has a good speaker, record your PSA into a solid 30 second recording and burn it onto a CD and mail it to the radio stations on your list. Again, include some free admission tickets and provide a hard copy of the PSA, which is on the CD. This is the ultimate lazy but most successful approach to promotional success. This is Greg Stoddard, Kilo Fox 9 Mike Papa, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The third QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will take place August 14th and 15th with presentations available on demand for 30 days. Sponsors promise a flawless experience and will expose visitors to new ideas, equipment, and practical techniques via the VFairs platform used successfully in the first QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo in August 2020. Some 80 speakers have been lined up to offer expert knowledge and information for amateurs to all experience levels. A live roundtable video will allow attendees to interact with each other and with exhibitors. The ARRL is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. Registration is now underway with full registration early bird tickets are $10. Full registration includes access to the entire expo, including presentations and the 30-day on-demand period. Free registration includes access to exhibitors, prizes, general lounge, and lobbies. Those who register for the March Expo already have a free registration for the August Expo. The Jodrell Bank Observatory, originally the Jodrell Bank Experimental Station, and then from 1966 to 1999, the Nuffield Radio Astronomy Laboratories, hosts a number of radio telescopes and is part of the Jodrell Bank Centre for Astrophysics at the University of Manchester. The Story of Jodrell Bank is the next talk at Denby Dale Amateur Radio Club. The speaker is Professor Ian Morrison from the Jodrell Bank Discovery Centre. His presentation at Denby Dale is on Wednesday, June the 30th at 7.30pm UK time, that's 18.30 UTC. The meeting on Zoom is open to all those interested in amateur radio and radio astronomy. The Zoom ID is 842-5221-3056. One of the world's pioneers of radio astronomy in the 1930s was Grota Reber, Whiskey 9 Golf Foxtrot Zulu. So it's not surprising that radio amateurs are interested in what discoveries are possible when tracking electromagnetic waves. Indonesia's amateur radio society, Orari, has published the inaugural issue of its new Orari digital magazine, dated June 2021, and it's available for download as a free PDF. 
Among the articles in this first edition is one about the Long Range or LoRa warning system, designed by Havid Aditama, Yankee Delta 2 Charlie Lima X-Ray, and Arafin Santoso, Yankee Charlie 2 Sierra Alpha Tango. This edition of the magazine can be downloaded from orari.or.id and then follow the link to the eMag. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. Visit the ARRL Learning Network webpage to register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions. Designing Coiled Coax Ugly Balance, hosted by John Portune, W6NBC, will be held on Thursday, July 8th, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 0100 UTC on Friday, July 9th. Coiled coax balance are familiar, but not many hams know how to design them for maximum efficiency. The many designs available online can be confusing, so this presentation will help you learn the following. The main function of a balance, calculating and not guessing at the amount of coax needed, and self-resonance and frequency limitations. The presenter is the February 2021 QST Cover Plaque Award winner for his article, Create Your Own One-to-One -one Coax Choke Ballon. Learning with High Altitude Balloons, hosted by Jack McElroy, KM4ZIA, and Audrey McElroy, KM4BUN, will be held on Thursday, July 22, 2021, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Jack McElroy, KM4ZIA, and Audrey McElroy, KM4BUN, talk about their experiences with high altitude balloons, explain how others can get involved in high altitude balloons, and discuss launching it successfully. Their discussion will include how high altitude balloons are a great way to involve more youth in ham radio and how they can be a fantastic learning experience for students. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change and is a member's only benefit. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. And finally this week, just beyond the soccer fields in a western North Carolina park, there were lessons to be learned by a group of youngsters ages 7 to 12. Equipped with direction-finding antennas and radio receivers, they were on the hunt for a radio transmitter emitting intermittent chirps somewhere in Jackson Park. Members of the Blue Ridge Amateur Radio Club had hidden the transmitter on the edge of a wooded area, a location far enough away to make a point about the directional nature and navigational power of radio signals. The kids, who were part of the county's exploration program, were getting a taste of amateur radio direction finding, or fox hunting, led by Club President Charles Webb, KN4KWA. Some of the kids monitored the radios while the others aimed the antenna. It was a day of combining nature with radio. It took nearly an hour, but thanks to good radio reception, the successful kids were not outfoxed. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.